everybody, and welcome to Beginners Academy. Uh, we're going to do a presentation tonight that came about uh, while I was on a trip uh, uh, to uh, Kansas and Oklahoma. And we're going to talk about launching a PICO balloon with the WBA ELK Sky Tracker Halo. And I want to welcome tonight uh, a guest uh, who's had some experiences with balloons. Uh, he's on Zoom with us, and that's Keith Kaiser, uh, WA0TJT. So uh, he, he's welcome to share some insights as we go along. Boy, they found an old photo of me, didn't they? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I knew about Keith because of... Uh, I heard his QSO Today interview, and um, uh, so when I headed to Kansas, I said, if I want to launch a balloon, this is a guy I need to look up, so. Yeah, and then I wasn't able to help you after all, so. Well, oh, well. you did. You encouraged me. <laughs> well, uh, so we're talking about uh, balloons. Uh, uh, high altitude balloons or HAB, and uh, they're balloons used by students and hobbyists and amateur radio operators. There's really two categories, near space balloons and PICO balloons. And I have no experience with near space balloons but uh, could you elaborate a little bit on that, Keith? You can uh, go ahead. On which kind do you mean? On the uh, uh, high altitude balloons or on the other? Uh, near space balloons. Okay, well, near space balloons are, near space balloons go, are the, uh, the rubber kind that you're used to seeing from Na National Weather Service launching. The, uh, these balloons will go up to about 120,000 feet. Uh, at that altitude, they will eventually burst, uh, probably right anywhere from about 80,000 to 120,000 is pretty much the uh, maximum that you can expect from them uh, before they, they burst. You can imagine that they're getting bigger and bigger and bigger as they uh, go up. And uh, uh, the whole flight will last about two and a half, maybe three hours. The absolute best time you'll have is chasing these balloons. <laughs> uh, my wife and I have uh, been doing this now for, you know, I don't remember anymore, 15 years, uh, about 15 years, I'd say, with Bill, with Bill Brown, WBADLK, and uh, the entire Great Plains Super Launch Group, which uh, literally had their, their convention just about a week before uh, Greg was up here. <laughs> It's too bad because uh, they would have really had a good time seeing him. Of course, we were all on Zoom, but nevertheless. Next year, we're going to meet in Indiana. At least that's the plan. Not exactly the Great Plains, but we uh, try to, to, to jump around from our various members, which uh, uh, do incorporate people all over the world. We've had people from England. We've had people from Russia. We've had people from Bulgaria. Last year was... Uh, several people, uh, several guys from Bel Bulgaria, we've had them from Belgium, uh, France, who have joined in on, uh, uh, come to our meetings or joined in on the Zoom. And uh, we have a lot of fun doing this. Uh, these guys are doing it year round. Uh, I'm pretty much out of the hobby at this point in time, uh, primarily because of the expense, frankly, I'm retired. And uh, it can cost quite a bit to launch one of these balloons. The balloon will cost, depending on what size you go, if you go with a 400 gram balloon, that's, that's not too bad. But if you go up to the 1500 or 3000 gram balloons, those will set you back anywhere from uh, $100 to $250, depending on what size you're going. And then there's the gas. Uh, we used to use helium all the time, of course, but uh, helium is pretty scarce. So we've uh, most converted to hydrogen. Uh, we've converted to hydrogen here as well. Uh, the name of my group was Near Space Ventures, 
and uh, we converted to hydrogen about uh, I'm going to say 10 years ago. And um, of course, everybody's first thing they're thinking about is, uh, you know, the Hindenburg. Well, study the Hindenburg, you find that it wasn't the hydrogen that blew up that, that dirigible. It was uh, all kinds of other stuff. And painting it with, or painting it with uh, very combustible paint didn't help any either. So anyway, right. So we have done, uh, my wife and I have done probably, I'm just going to guess here, 75. I lost count, to be honest with you, about 75. And I've probably helped on a few more than that because of uh, uh, standalone scouting uh, that I was at. Yeah. Whoa, what was that? Sure. Sounded like a dog. It sounded like a dog, yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, I guess I could make a point here that... Uh, the balloon launch I was involved with was not a near space, high altitude balloon. So, but I, I wanted to bring out the distinction that there are, you know, at least two types. So, yeah. Well, that's awesome, Keith. And uh, uh, thanks for helping me out with the near space side of things. Did yeah, you have anything could've... else before we move on? Uh, no, I'm just going to say I wish I had can, we, we could have worked out a schedule so we could have been there for your launch. Turned out to be a, a very interesting flight. Um, I heard you talking earlier that it uh, is probably gone. Don't count, don't count it out yet. It could still be there. Uh, they've disappeared for weeks at a time and then all of a sudden turned up again. They might turn up over Russia or China or... Uh, somewhere over the Pacific or Atlantic Oceans or over the North Pole. So while it disappeared, that doesn't mean it's gone. Yes. Not, not yet, anyway. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm checking on it every day. <laughs> okay. Uh, so the category of balloon I was using is called a Pico balloon. And this is kind of a loose definition, but... <clears throat> uh, 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 these are smaller balloons, uh, and uh, they have a very light uh, payload. So they basically, if things are done properly, they'll float possibly around the globe. Well, the picture on the right is pretty much the balloon I used, and the gentleman <coughs> holding the payload there is Bill Brown. Yeah, while, you're holding, okay. while you're doing that, I can't share, so. All righty. <clears throat> uh, sorry about that. Okay. So we talked about near space balloons. Well, now we're on uh, Pico balloons. Well, a little background. <clears throat> I purchased what uh, Bill calls a sky tracker. And Bill is W-B-A-E-L-K. He lives in North Alabama. And uh, <clears throat> he's developed a, <clears throat> a payload that's uh, about 12 grams. And uh, he has uh, 30 years of experience with balloons. So uh, Basically, he was the genius that put it all together. And uh, so I bought a Sky Tracker for less than $150. And I was saving it for Kansas because I thought, well, the balloon's going to go up. It's going to go to the east. So I'd like to have uh, uh, half of the country here to float the balloon over. Uh, on its way east, but uh, that wasn't what happened at all. So, but anyway, uh, COVID hit and I put off visiting relatives in Kansas and Oklahoma, but this year, uh, Linda, my wife and I decided to take a one month camping adventure to Kansas and uh, Oklahoma. And uh, uh, we packed the uh, Sky Tracker almost forgot it, but basically the, the Sky Tracker sat in the box for a couple of years. 
And I got in touch with Keith. I said, well, uh, I, I didn't have a lot of confidence that I could do it. <laughs> but uh, uh, I got in contact with Keith and we chatted. But uh, ultimately our schedules, the weather and all didn't really come together. Uh, but um, uh, he was helpful nevertheless. Uh, this is uh, Bill Brown, um, and uh, <clears throat> Bill uh, got very interested in space uh, with the Kittinger project or the High Man project. And uh, uh, so basically, I can't quote the details, but it was an early experiment with uh, uh, a human jumping out of uh, a balloon that basically was in space or near space. Well, anyway, uh, that very much impressed Bill and he got an interest in this near space thing. And uh, he's, uh, he's uh, the expert. Of course, there's many folks doing it, but uh, so I leveraged off of Bill Brown, who else? And uh, he's made it very accessible to people that aren't experts and uh, uh, just told us how to do it. So uh, thanks to Bill there. He's considered the father of high altitude ballooning, by the way. Yes. Worldwide. So, uh, the payload that Bill's developed is called uh, the Sky Tracker, weighs about 12 grams. It's solar powered, and you see the solar panels there on the right. And um, uh, there's two versions, I believe. Uh, the one I use uh, transmit on uh, APRS, and that's how we kept up with the, with the balloon after it was launched. And uh, hey, putting together that uh, circuit board with a GPS, uh, uh, some kind of controller, a transmitter, solar panel, and making it very light is quite an engineering feat. So hats off to Bill Brown for doing that. And then selling it at a reasonable price is uh, just made this all possible. Um, a Whisper version, uh, he doesn't recommend starting out with Whisper, but uh, uh, Whisper would have a lot more range than uh, APRS. So if your balloon was out over the Atlantic, uh, you're, you're still gonna track it. With APRS, uh, after it gets so far out, uh, you probably couldn't track it unless it was near an island. That Is the Whisper HF, Greg? Yes. It would, well, I'm not experienced at it, but I think it would be like uh, 20 meters. Yeah, I, I've done some receiving on 20 meter balloons. Yeah. yeah. Especially when they get up here because there's no one else here, it seems. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, it's, yeah, his whisper uh, goes around the world and changes frequencies and everything it has to do to stay legal uh, across other countries. Because there are two countries in the world that you can't fly over with an amateur radio, and that's England, believe it or not, and wow. of course, North, North, uh, North uh, Korea. But those are really? the only two countries. Uh, so his uh, thing changes, his, his transmitter changes frequencies for all the countries, wherever it's going, it can pick up the, it picks up the, at a new frequency and then he blocks off the countries that don't allow it. All right. Holy cow. All right, in terms of balloons, um, the uh, one on the left is the balloon I use. It's similar to a party balloon. Um, Bill just put it in the box and I believe it's this, Koala Letix, 36 inch Mylar. Um, so it's a very inexpensive 
balloon and, um, you know, which is part of the good things. Um, but there's a higher performance balloon uh, that's available uh, and it would be something like on the right there, uh, Scientific Balloon Solutions. And um, I've never uh, obviously used one of those, but, but that's really an upgrade. And um, uh, a lot of the balloons I'm seeing are up more 38,000 feet instead of 28,000. And I don't know for sure, but I suspect they're using these SBS balloons. Well, uh, Bill and I had lots of conversation about uh, getting some gas for our launch out there. And uh, uh, there's choice, Bill's already mentioned hydrogen and helium. And the lesson learned is if you want uh, helium, um, uh, you can't just run out and get it <laughs> on a weekend or maybe even a week before. Uh, I made some calls around and, uh, and um, it just wasn't in the picture. And I wasn't gonna go for hydrogen, uh, that would have been wonderful, but uh, but I'm calling it party time helium. But basically, I uh, went to Walmart and got their party balloon tank. Uh, um, they had a couple there, and I got the one that said jumbo. And so on the right, the two pictures there are the uh, source of helium I used. So, but. I really got a lot, even though there's better options, uh, I was very pleased with the performance. Is that, a, is that not a pure helium, the party time helium, Greg? Uh, no, uh, on the package it says uh, basically that it's 80%. If that. If that. I, I gotta ask a question. Please. You didn't play with your voice by sucking some heat. <laughs> no, but we're, the tank's we're all thinking that, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I knew we all were, but I'm the one that's going to bring it up, right? <laughs> oh, my name's Greg. <laughs> no, I didn't. Sorry. I didn't go for <laughs> I would have. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> yeah. So, well, thank Sorry. goodness for Walmart. Because uh, uh, that was my source of uh, lifting gas, so to speak. Well, um, part of the fun is picking your launch site. Well, basically, you need some open space. Um, and you need light winds. And um, so... Uh, if you don't have enough space, the balloon might not get enough altitude before it gets tangled in a tree. So, And um, basically, I was trying to get together with Keith, and it turned out that uh, we were pulling out on the day that we could get together, and it was just too much. And that would be in Kansas, since Keith is in Kansas City. But my next stop was uh, um, Keystone State Park near Tulsa, Oklahoma. And also another factor is uh, the weather. And really, um, and I believe that's my next slide on the weather. So anyway, uh, at the park, Fortunately, the winds were in the right direction that basically I launched over the lake, Keystone Lake, and I needed some good weather. Uh, another thing that's helpful if you have um, uh, some type of closed space to prepare the balloon and check the lift, and uh, this is our trailer, and so 
So I had a nice space where I could get out of the wind. And pick your launch day. Uh, Bill said in the instructions, try to launch on a calm day under five to 10 knots and less than 50% overcast skies. And um, over on the right, uh, this was the conditions on uh, Tuesday morning. And basically we had 1% cloud cover, 11 miles of visibility and no cloud ceiling. So I said, this is it. <laughs> so we went ahead and uh, prepping the balloon, um, uh, basically, you're trying to fill the balloon with uh, the, the uh, gas until you get a, uh, uh, a lift. Well, actually, you want to lift the pay payload plus have a little extra to get, your, get the balloon to rise. And uh, for this arrangement, it's 2.7 to 3 grams of free lift. And by the way, a penny weighs 2.5 grams. So it's about a penny's worth of lift there. Uh, this is some of the things I got from Bill and uh, he had a little card and he had weighed out the Sky Tracker at 12.24 grams. He weighed the little uh, fishing line that was supplied and the tape. And he came up with a total of 12, almost 13 grams. So we wanted uh, the balloon to have uh, a lift that was three grams more than that. So that puts us about 15.92 grams. Well, I, you know, I'd never done this before. So I read the instructions and scratched my head but basically on the right side, uh, he supplied a white tube that I used to fill the balloon and a little baggie with a clip. So basically I was filling the balloon until the tube and I, I left the tube in it and I put the baggie on. So I wanted to fill the balloon until it would just be neutrally buoyant with both the tube and the baggie, which was preset to be the correct weight. So did you did you send them the quarter and the penny back when you were done? No, it's actually a nickel and a penny. Oh. <laughs> it's a nickel, a penny, and two BBs or something. Okay. <laughs> So. Hardly worth the postage then, eh, Rick? <laughs> right. He, he's trying to get some change. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I gained six cents out of this. So thanks to Bill. He supplies. I didn't have to use my own penny and nickel. All right. Well, this was in the trailer, and I just got a shot of the payload on the left there. And you won't be able to see it, but there's a little strip which has uh, Bill Brown's uh, email address. So if the balloon gets found, um, and sometimes they do, uh, they could get in touch with a uh, Bill. And uh, but um, <clears throat> and on the right is uh, the balloon. I don't. I didn't even have experience with party balloons, <laughs> but but I do now. All right. And basically, you notice that the balloon is underinflated, and uh, that's on purpose um, uh, because uh, it's going to expand at higher altitudes, and and we don't want it to burst. So so the goal is not to have the balloon burst and that way it will have a very long lifetime. You should have got a balloon that might have said like on the other side of it, have a nice day with the smiley face. The, these oh, balloons are actually custom made balloons. They're not, uh, you can't actually buy these in a store anywhere. 
Yeah, oh, you, oh, oh, you can't. Okay. Yeah, the balloons that they sell in the stores, uh, it, it, we we discovered early on during this hobby that they have a tendency to pull apart at the seams. The seams uh, don't hold; they're not glued very well. Uh, so, well, that would make sense. Sure. So we started building our own balloons, and then a company came in and started building them for us. And uh, uh, now they're all custom made and. And uh, they cost a little bit more than a party balloon, but really not that much. It's uh, they're they're really nice balloons. And the SBS balloon that um, that Greg showed you is uh, that's also a mylar balloon. It's just not painted with the silver like these are. All right. Well, uh, this is overlooking the lake, and I haven't let go yet. But uh, I've got on here. Notice the antenna, uh, which. Um, is basically uh, two guitar strings. And um, so basically, uh, you can probably guess the length of those guitar strings. So it basically makes a uh, vertical dipole. Um, of course, it's very lightweight. So um, that's how the antenna was handled. Uh, the top string is uh, threaded through the support line there and the bottom part just hangs down. So, so the complete package, of course, needs an antenna and, and that's how that was handled. Well, up, up and away and uh, so I got it prepped. I had no idea. <laughs> I thought it was going to fall into the water, but it didn't. And it was just a beautiful launch. It was about quarter to 10 on July 20th, 2021. Well, we'll see if our video can play. Hello, yet. this is Greg N4KGL, amateur radio operator. Uh, I'm at uh, Keystone State Park in Oklahoma, and uh, I've prepared a balloon payload uh, developed by uh, Bill Brown, W-B-A-E-L-K, and uh, we're using party balloon helium uh, in the balloon, uh, which is not as good as the pure helium, but it's going to work for us today. And this is the uh, payload that Bill developed uh, with the, uh, uh, it does uh, APERS, uh, Automatic Position Report, Reporting System, uh, which can be picked up by uh, uh, stations uh, in the United States and actually around the world. Uh, so in theory, uh, this balloon is going to go to uh, uh, above 20,000 feet and float around and if we're in luck it will go uh, many miles toward the Atlantic and who knows what after that. That is if we've done everything correctly. So we followed Bill's uh, instructions. And we have excellent uh, uh, weather, uh, and uh, I believe we're within tolerances for doing the launch. So, so we're going to go down to the lake with the wind to our back and do a, do the launch. Uh, here's our launch point. Uh, the uh, APRS uh, ID for this balloon is N4KGL-11. So you'll be able to track it on um, APRS.FI or any of the other online APERS uh, maps. All right, so we'll uh, give this a little slack here. Uh, wind is over the lake, and uh, there's a lower part of the antenna. Hopefully, it doesn't get wet. 
so here we go it is doing just this beautiful up up and away balloon here and uh, it's definitely airborne <clears throat> it'll have to be above those trees but uh, I don't think that's going to be a problem. So we'll just watch it as long as we can here. Uh, kind of a... <clears throat> I really doubt with this camera that you can... Um, Actually, you can still see it. <laughs> see a lot, but uh, I've had this balloon for uh, uh, over two years. And... Um, <clears throat> uh, we are out in Oklahoma which turns out to be an excellent spot to launch so we'll uh, check our radio and look for reports and uh, <clears throat> wish it good luck on its journey uh, this is uh, n4kgl uh, thanks for watching <laughs> well keith did i do that right I think Great you did launch, everything. Anyway. I, I think Here. you did everything perfect, and you obviously got the uh, tolerances, as you said, correct. The 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 only thing you got wrong was APRS actually stands for Automatic Packet Reporting System, but okay. uh, even Bob Berninga, who invented the thing, calls it a position once in a while. That's that's yeah. because uh, most people use it for that. But you can send email by it if you want to. So yeah. I mean, it's very talented stuff. Yeah, you did a great job. Uh, a, a very, very good job. Your your tolerances were right dead on, better than my first time with a Pico. Uh, I was a little bit off and I don't even know where it landed. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, you, you did great. Well, thank you. Your, uh, your heart must have been in your mouth, Craig, when you <laughs> let go of that thing and you got nothing but water and no boat to retrieve it. I like he how you said, we need to clear the trees. <laughs> <laughs> he was well above any tree I well, saw. <laughs> believe me. Well, yes, you're, you're right, Chris. And, and everything was a surprise. It floats. Yeah, and it, and it reports on apers. And uh, that was a really cool. I like how that worked out. The only, the only thing missing was NASA doing the official <laughs> and we have liftoff and launch the and, yeah and, and yeah. all those different teams going and we're up <laughs> <laughs> yeah that was really yeah, cool that was i'm I, that was that's I, i'm sorry i i don't i don't have a word that was awesome yeah that was amazing i, I should yeah. watch one here at the beach i had a great time i tell you well, the other half, uh, once it's is launched, it, is that uh, the first? Is that the first time it reported to you, right there? That's the first one I caught. Yes. Okay, all right, okay, that's fine. And it was at fifth, about sixteen hundred feet. And what, what uh, altitude were you when you launched it? Um, I don't know. Oh. <laughs> Good question. <laughs> okay. Well, a lot of us. Well, some of us are familiar with APRS, Automatic Packet Reporting System, but um, uh, there are uh, a couple of websites, APRS.FI, and that's a screenshot from APRS.FI. Uh, there's a, another site called apersdirect.com that's very similar. I think it's a lot newer. And there's a site specific to high altitude balloons. It's called uh, tracker.habhub.org. So, so I was jumping between all those um, to keep up with the balloon. Now, Greg, I want a PRS.fi and I clicked on details and there was a red flag after your uh, uh, Y2-1 and all that stuff saying that this is not a wise, I forget what the heck it said, that, that you did some kind of no-no. I didn't understand what the no-no was. But. Well, when you put uh, 
when you have something at a high altitude and it's being picked up by multiple uh, eye gates and all this, it's not good for the network, but the network tolerated it. That's all I can say. Would, would wide one have been more tolerable? Like, I, don't, I, don't understand. I don't even know what it was. Yeah, yeah, I'm not an APERS expert either. It, but it, it wouldn't matter what it was because even if it was like a, a two hop, it would hit so many receivers at the same time that that two hop would be yeah. practically over the whole country. So yeah. a, a two hop to it could end up being, you know, hundreds of hops, really. That's what they were complaining about. Well, they're, they're all they're all set at wide one, and and but you're absolutely correct. But the system is much more robust than that. It's not. It's an old error. Or it's an old warning that came out, oh, way back in the early two thousands about that particular issue, and it really is just not very realistic anymore. Yeah, it's a non-issue now, Wakey. It in in most people's opinion, <laughs> it's a non-issue, and I think if you were to reach out to Bob and ask him, he'd tell you the same thing, so. Okay. Cool, because I'm thinking of doing this someday, Craig. Sure. But I, I might have to do Whisper because there ain't a whole lot of <laughs> APRS. If it goes north from here, it's not going to be talking. Well, if anybody. it goes north, you're right. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think or you have to worry about it. I don't think you have to worry <laughs> about it. APRS is er 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 almost everywhere nowadays, especially over the mm -hmm. United States. You'd lose it over the oceans, of course, yeah. but once you hit uh, Europe or uh, anywhere over there, it'll start picking up yeah. again and it'll take you all the way to Japan around that direction, and then you'll lose it for yeah, a little while over the ocean again. If you, if you look on a map where I am, Keith, there's not much up here. <laughs> I don't think there's any APRS oh. in my area. Ah. Well, you need uh, to set it up chris so <laughs> well one guy had it in his house but then he got divorced yeah. and moved so it's not uh -oh. happening anymore little raspberry pi set up to be an eye gate using dire wolf is all it takes it's very simple yeah yeah, yeah. trouble is uh, you go east west or north there's i mean you go west and you're into winnipeg i well, guess there's probably one there i'll just say this I, yeah. maybe sometimes we take aprs for granted maybe but yeah. believe me for for high altitude balloons, this is awesome. And yeah, I think the, I'd be interested. In, I'd like to go twenty meters. That's kind of interesting. Yeah. Maybe. Well, the alternative is Whisper and yeah, and HF. Yeah, that's a little more advanced. So Bill said, start with start with Apers. Mm -hmm. I got a lot out of Apers. You have so, a long you have a long antenna on the Whisper one, and it can cause you a lot of problems. So. Getting it up in the air can be uh, very challenging, and that's the big problem with it. Plus, of course, if you're going to go with a more expensive unit, then you'll probably want to go with a more expensive balloon and go with the SBS 13. And, right. uh, and that's very a lot more difficult to fill up correctly as well. So you have all kinds of things to complicate matters. Now, if you really want to just try something and you want to you know, just go with anything, go with a latex balloon for your first couple launches. It's a very e much easier way to learn how to do launches, and then you can transfer that knowledge to PICOs. Okay. Yeah. Well, a uh, few more details about the uh, APRS uh, beacon, essentially. Uh, with the Sky Tracker, the position is transmitted every two minutes, and on uh, for the U.S., it's 144.390, but uh, Bill also set up a separate frequency uh, that's basically clear, and I used uh, an HT, and there's a picture of the HT over there, and I just got a big kick out of tracking this with my own HT directly in part because, hey, that's a good reason to have this HT is to get the report. So that balloon was gone, but I was getting uh, reports on it with my own little HT for, for quite a while. Uh, one detail is the tracker has to be in sunlight. 
uh, to send positions. And uh, that's why it would wake up about 8.30 in the morning when the sun was high enough. <clears throat> and it would stop at night when the sun got too low. So it's solar powered. There is a super capacitor on board to help smooth things out, but, but it is basically reporting in the daytime. Uh, Bill put my call sign uh, dash 11. He built that into the tracker. And as we know, uh, if your uh, packet gets received by a relay to an APERS eye gate, then it will get on these websites on the, on the maps and so forth. But you can also get it directly for a while. You can get it on your own little radio. So I got a kick now, out of that. I might have missed something. Is that balloon still aloft? Are you still getting reporting on it? It is unknown. Unknown right now. But uh, we'll get to that. But the. Uh, oh, okay. I didn't mean to jump in. I'm yeah, sorry. It's fine. But uh, uh, as uh, Keith can tell you, it very well could still be out there. Well, what was the. Uh, you might get to it in a minute. But what was the last reporting station? Well, I'll show Some you. Sniffles. Oh, okay. I'm I jumping got a ahead. slide on it. Okay. It's, right, I'm it's so, I'm up sorry. by Mount Sniffle. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, so there is such a great use for APRS. And uh, we'll see if this will play, but uh, you'll notice uh, I'm capturing um, screenshots of it uh, ascending and uh, there it's about a mile high. And I treated every one of these screenshots like this was going to be the last one, but, but obviously not. So um, you can also it's see that mouth. it's moving. It's moving. Uh, I guess the wind was out of the northeast and it's headed southwest. Did you have something, Chris? It is near Mount Sniffles. I told you. <laughs> I yeah. shouldn't have doubted you, Bob. <laughs> you think I can work an eight-digit right. grid coordinate, but I can't see Mount Sniffles? <laughs> you, you can also I see apologize, Bob. <laughs> at times it's moving 30 miles per hour. And now we're up to uh, 22,000 feet. So I believe this ascent took uh, about four hours, and it's uh, kind of moving toward... Uh, Oklahoma City. So here we're over. Um, eventually, it gets to 28,000 feet. And that really, it was, it eventually got to about 28,400. And it was from day to day, it was practically the same all the way through. So, so cruising uh, 28,000 feet, that's, that is just uh, very cool. So Keith, am I correct if I, if I did Look go to SBS balloon, maybe I could get 38,000 feet? Yeah, as long as you're using some more pure gas, uh, either yeah. helium or uh, hydrogen, at the amount that you need um, for a, a helium launch, you might want to you might want to look at hydrogen instead. It'd be a lot cheaper, half the price at least. Yeah. So, uh, you, you so should, with an SPS thirteen, the... you should hit thirty eight thousand or or um, even forty thousand, perhaps. Yeah. So that's the well, path that balloon took. Yeah, well, let me try to explain. Wow, that's kind of, no, that's amazing. Yeah, well, well I call it drama and surprises. Okay, <laughs> so uh, kind of the tip up here was the launch site. And I don't know if you can see the cursor, but the first day it, it actually made it into Texas. Uh, 
near Dallas. And at the end of the day, uh, it went to sleep, or the reports did. Uh, basically, the electronics shut down. And it, and you know, we didn't know what was going to happen, but it woke up the next morning uh, uh, practically uh, near the border of Mexico. Heading for and, a beer, Mexican beer. Yeah, <laughs> man, it was getting out of town. And, and then uh, it's hard to give a day-by-day -day breakdown, but basically it was uh, headed to Mexico. And I said, well, that's it. It's going to go toward Mexico. It's just going to keep going. I won't hear from it again. But, but then... To the people following it, we were all surprised. Okay, the next day, it shows up over here <laughs> in another part of Mexico. So basically, it probably went a lot further down into Mexico. And I call this boomerang because it turned around. <laughs> uh, believe it or not, there's a lot of apers, eye gates in Mexico, <laughs> or some particularly near the border there. And it, it, uh, it went across Texas and, um, um, and I guess another day went by. Well, it almost came back to the launch site. So no way I would ever thought that it would have gone to Mexico and then come back to Oklahoma. But it did. Well, the, the impressive part was there was three people hanging on to it when it came back. <laughs> Maybe so. Uh oh, this is getting political, I can tell. <laughs> All right. So well, I'm turn bots off. <laughs> um, well, to complete it there, then it took it a turn. It went over my mother's house, it looks like. She, I'm surprised she didn't shoot it down. <laughs> well, I was thinking that it would come down and I could pick it up and, and just. That's know, amazing. That pump up the balloon right again. is amazing. <laughs> and then it took a turn toward uh, what? The southeast. And you see there's some dashed lines. Well, that was overnight. And uh, it showed up way down. Uh, uh, On Bourbon Street. Yeah. Well, a little <laughs> east west of there. But anyway. That's where the three people jumped off at. Is where that. <laughs> it's, a, you know, it's, it's headed toward the Gulf. And I said, it's going to go out in the Gulf and we're never going to hear from it again. Well, somehow it went out in the Gulf. Then it turned around and retraced its steps. Then came back, went across Louisiana and um, uh, spent the night. And then it got on a track where it went over New Mexico and headed toward Colorado. And okay, actually, I got, yes, I got, a, I got a question about the Gulf. It got far enough out in the Gulf. Like when we're looking at it, it's got a circle that I, I guess describes how far that signal can go line of sight with the altitude it's at. Is that correct when you're looking at an apers map i wasn't sure about the circles i i think uh if you were looking at the hab hub map yes they yeah. they have the what you can expect for line well, of sight of the apers signal anyhow it looked like you were beyond any land when you got well, picked up way down in the gulf was that a little bit of uh tropo or no well if you if um uh i was watching it and what happened was that there were some packets, just a few packets <laughs> were getting through at, at a great distance that you would never expect. And, There's also uh, a lot of oil rigs down there and they a lot of them have uh, ham shacks on them that are running a yeah. as well. Ah, so, cool. So anyway, I was very impressed that we could even see it. The next slide is a smoother picture of the whole thing. Uh, this is from the Hab Hub site, and uh, so uh, it just 
filled in the nights. And uh, so that was the whole, the whole trek so far, you know. Um, and the next slide, some of you are already looking at it, but this was the last report. And uh, it was uh, a little over 10 days after the launch. It was in Colorado and it was at 28,000 and everything is good. The only problem is it's uh, 5.50 and it's getting dark or the sun's getting pretty low. So it stopped transmitting. But that's the last report I've gotten to date. So. Uh, in the area north of that, are there enough apers receiving stations to pick it up if it was still healthy Absolutely. or are we getting, yeah? Oh yeah, the right. United States is covered from, from corner to corner. There are no dead spots in the United States for apers at all. Okay. And I was just in Colorado myself, yeah. and so I can also attest to that. But uh, Colorado has a huge high-altitude ballooning group in it. Uh, they have literally launched hundreds of balloons. I think they celebrated their 300th launch in uh, July when we had our convention. Wow. And there's many, 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 many APRS stations in uh, Colorado. Hey, Greg, can you go back to the screen prior to that, the shot prior to that? That's this an one? impress. No, that yeah, that one. That's an impressive loop right there. Wow. Yeah, you should get that. You should frame that. Put on your wall, Greg. Yeah, it could be trying to <laughs> communicate something to us. That is. Look how far <laughs> out. Look how far out the Gulf it went. Yeah. And then came. Actually. That is, and then wound up up in Colorado. That's yeah. impressive right there. Now, no, I ask you about that, Greg. Do you need permission to be doing this? That's a pretty impressive loop. Um, well, Keith can comment on that, but uh, I believe the answer is no. That is correct. No is the answer if the payload is less than 12 pounds. Actually, the payload is including the weight of the balloon and everything else has to be less than 12 pounds. However, you don't have to you don't have to get permission to do it for less than 12 pounds. However, it is our common practice that we will notify the uh, uh, tower at the uh, FAA tower the closest to us on uh, when we do a launch, just in case. But there has never been, been there's never been an airplane that's hit a, a balloon, and if one did, that it would not even know it hit it. It would be gone, and that includes the big latex balloons that we launch. This little thing would be less than a fly speck in considering hitting it. So. Um, you would never know if it hit an airplane, even a small airplane. It would never know it hit it. And there's no requirement. However, it is common practice to do it anyway, to notify FAA. Not on the Picos, but on the latex balloons. Okay. Yeah. It's obvious Keith didn't see that transformer. <laughs> <laughs> if anyone could do it, Greg. I've, I've, seen, I've seen balloons tied into trend, into power lines uh, several times, so yeah, I can speak for that. Yeah. Well, there's a similar thing with rockets, and, and, and they've been hung on power lines too, so. Yeah. I'm just impressed by that path. Wow. I'm just impressed by that. Um, but that's just well, fantastic. Congratulations, young man. Thank you. Um, Keith? Did you have any, would you have predicted such a flight or? No, I, I expected it to go east. I was surprised <laughs> as, it, as everybody else was. Even Bill was surprised it went south. I mean, it yeah. just, uh, of course, you'd never know what those winds are going to do. Um, we used to have, uh, Hab Hub still does this. And uh, many years ago when we first got started, uh, another guy and I wrote some code on the web to do predictions of where things were going to land. Uh, based on Bill Brown's code, though, by the way, I mean, he wrote it originally in in BASIC, I believe, and we rewrote it in uh, Perl, <laughs> and then I put a web behind, I mean, a, a map behind it so we could see where everything was. I don't even think it would have predicted it going south. That was just a strange direction. And by the way, the FAA, 
launches, uh, not the FAA, the National Weather Service launches uh, hundreds of the hundreds of latex balloons every single day uh, from all over the country and all over South America and all over a number of other countries. And um, there's uh, nobody ever has to notify the FAA about any of this. Yeah. Well, this uh, is a screenshot of a HAB hub. So if you want to know what's in the air, um, any day you can go to tracker.habhub.org, I think, and you'll see these pretty pictures of uh, the balloons and, and N4 KGL-11 was, was in this. <laughs> While, while it was active there or be. And uh, so uh, this site uh, figures out uh, out of vapors what are balloons and uh, it is, it's very impressive. And it, so. So you, you uh, don't have to go register with them, Greg? They, no, they figure that out on its, on its own it just, just by your altitude and stuff? It just happened. I, I don't know how they figured it wow. out. It all comes that's in cool. from APERS. It's all part of the APERS IS system. Yeah. And uh, that shows but, how expansive it is. And and if you do bring up one, well, you can see all the balloons over Europe over there on the right side of the screen and all those towers and everything. Those are official reporting people in of APERS, but there's 10 times that many more over here in the United States. And it goes all the way around. There's even... Apers reporting stations in China and Russia and um, all over in there. No, but you can't go anywhere without finding it except North North Korea. They are possibly the only country in the in the entire world that doesn't have a Napers station. <laughs> yes. Well, you know, uh, Bob Brudinga. You know, could he have imagined how far this idea was going to go? You know, well, Bob did, yeah, Bob, Bob invented Apers, but uh, yeah, I think he probably knew what was going to happen. He was, he's a pretty impressive guy, too. Yes, if you don't mind getting into an argument about something, <laughs> <laughs> he's, he, but he's a good guy, too, and he's still around, he still teaches at the Naval yes. Academy. So, yeah, he's a, he's a good guy, and yeah. Bill is over at NASA, of course, in Alabama, and we are going to have the GPSL in uh, Alabama in 2023 it was supposed to be next year and this year was supposed oh. to be in um, indiana but because of covid we uh, went zoom again and everybody launched from their own location and uh, so it's already been agreed that 2022 will be in indiana at skyport there in indiana it's by what's the name of that college honey purdue, purdue. it's not too far outside of purdue university there and then the following year will be in Alabama from the NASA. Uh, well, come facility. on down. <laughs> awesome. None of those cities are exactly Great Plains, but uh, <laughs> the furthest east I've launched from is, yeah. uh, Milwaukee. We, we did from uh, Milwaukee a few years back. So, Well, to wind this up, this was so much fun. So... And it was fun for everybody following it. So, and there, it just goes to show there's always something new to learn in ham radio. I'm just blown away by APERS. You know, it's just all voluntary that people put all that infrastructure together and it just works so well. And thanks to Bill and Keith and, um, I may try another launch, maybe go with SBS, but um, uh, it, it will be new territory and hopefully uh, I can follow the instructions. Well, you're an expert and, uh, now. I would say uh, this is definitely a STEM uh, student opportunity and I know Keith and Bill have worked with a lot of students. Um, uh, I haven't done it personally, but I, I imagine this is just, uh, it would be awesome. I doubt that there's a weekend that goes by that Bill isn't doing a launch. And he's been doing this right. for 20, 28 or 
29 years now. So how much, uh, I'm sorry, you said this earlier at the beginning, but your balloon that you launched approximately the cost of it. Well, the tracker and the balloon, uh, which just came in the same box. I don't know if it was 140 bucks, something in that neighborhood. I'm actually yeah. thinking about when I take that big trip next year to Washington state. Yes. Launching one from Washington state outside of Seattle to see where it goes. I think that would be great. We have a big, I'm actually a big thinking about it. That'd be really there. cool. There's a big club up there. And if you, oh, reach is out, there? You, oh, there's lots of clubs all over the country. If you, um, once you get up there and you want to look for them uh, or contact them in advance, uh, go to the Great Plains Super Launch website, Great Plains Super Launch. Oh, it's called uh, superlaunch.org, superlaunch.org. And uh, reach out to somebody that's on there, or you can reach out to me and I can help you try and find somebody up in that area. But there's uh, groups everywhere. We, uh, I was part of a launch um, online part. I wasn't there in person that launched in Hawaii. So, <laughs> and if you think a uh, landing in- Oh, Hawaii would have been cool. Grabbing a, a, a latex, yeah, but this was the latex balloon launch. This was not a Pico. So <laughs> if it went in the water, it was gone. I mean, it would, you know, you only have a cup, about two and a half hour flight on a latex balloon. But it goes a lot higher. It goes 120,000 feet. So it goes up 20, 21 miles instead of uh, just, uh, you know, 28,000 feet. So. Well, we, we, we're going to wind up at the base of Mount Rainier, which... <laughs> That's pretty high altitude stuff right there. Yeah. You could you could launch from there would be Yeah. I I don't think there would be any more challenge from then from anywhere else, to be honest with you. Right Other than there. hitting the mountain. Well, well, hopefully well, the wind <laughs> is blowing the right way. So yeah, yeah. I, I, if it's blowing I, at the I bottom, actually, I uh, I'm gonna consider that. I'm gonna consider yeah. that. I got I got a few months. That I think that'd be kind of cool. Yeah. Well, uh, I loved it. I love this. This is this yeah. is great. Uh, there are, uh, you know, there's a lot of innovative folks around, and they're coming up with their own trackers. Uh, QRP Labs uh, uh, has one, and uh, um, so, but uh, I'm probably going to stick with Bill. But there are other. Opportunity and this is kind of a do it your it can be a do it yourself if you're a real pro on electronics and integrating things together. Um, well, Bill's uh, tracker is uh, the the board uh, is populated in uh, uh, the board itself is made in China, but it's populated here in the states somewhere. I can't remember where he told me anymore, and um, it be, it's all surface level stuff. So. If you know how to do surface level soldering, you're in pretty good shape. <laughs> well, I couldn't. I couldn't do that when I was young. I'm, I sure as hell can't. I'm do it so now. impressed, you know, that this little tracker is really state of the art. It is awesome. You, you really, it's hard to imagine the things that this tracker does. I, I think I gave you a little bit of a hint when I said it was changing frequencies, but that's not all it does. It has to know when it's over a country that will allow and won't allow transmissions in the first place. It has to be able to change uh, transmission frequencies like four or five or six times. I can't remember exactly what. And it sends back other telemetry as well. It's sending right. back the, the temperature of the of the unit it's in, the temperature around it, the air temperature. It's uh, it's sending all kinds of stuff back. And Bill wrote all that code and he. He designed all of that stuff himself. Uh, he is a extraordinarily intelligent person. <laughs> and I'll jump to the last bullet there. He's given a talk at the Huntsville Ham Fest uh, hmm. this month up there yes, in Huntsville. It it's all on. So, and uh, he'll also launch. Uh, from uh, the parking lot there, um, I guess. He's launched, he launches almost every year from, from Dayton as well when Dayton is running. I've helped him uh, several times from Dayton, so yeah. Yeah. 
And um, Tom Medlin, W5KUB, has gotten into this. He has a podcast and he also goes to all the ham fest and, and does essentially a live show. But uh, so he's, and he and his friends have uh, done um, uh, some launches and mix things up. So you might want to check out his website and uh, look at some of his launches. And this is just my info, uh, but uh, well, uh, so do we have uh, more questions about this? Maybe questions Keith could answer. Uh, what, what was the, I kind of missed it, the cost all in with the helium and everything, Greg, what would you estimate? Well, the 140 plus 30 something for the helium. So, um, so, so uh, not much more than that. So under yeah. 200 then. That's right. Oh, well, don't forget your gas to drive to uh, Oklahoma. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm not he had counting, to go there anyhow. But <laughs> he had to visit relatives. Well, let me just that say. Was a, that was a honeydew, wasn't it, Greg? Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> I've been involved with high power rocketry. And um, a, uh, in that world, uh, they may be flying, well, a motor that's 150 bucks and the motor burns off in uh, less than two seconds or three seconds and it's gone. <laughs> so, so those folks are uh, spending hundreds of dollars for, um, you know, a few seconds of lift there. So a, la a latex flight will cost you about the initial cost will be about the same uh, between gas and the balloon. But the difference is you get your payload back. Um, yeah. You always, you will always, well, you should always find it. I, I will admit, and I'm very embarrassed to admit it. We'd lost one. <laughs> we lost wow. one that was, uh, I, my story is, and I'll stick with it for the rest of my life is it was dragged out of the, the cornfield at land, actually the soybean field it landed in by a deer. It was dragged out and we never could follow it because it's the only thing that made sense. We know exactly where it went. We know where it was supposed to land. We know everything about it because you're tracking the thing the whole time. And uh, it, it, uh, it walked itself out of a wet, soggy bean field. And that's why we didn't recover, recover it right away. Well, so. Now that's think, what you see down there is a package that I used to fly uh, uh, for balloons, that thing I'm holding in my hand there. It's got cameras in it. It's got GPSs in it. It's got, uh, uh, I think that was one of the old ones where I even had a, uh, not an iPad, but what were those old ones called? I can't even remember anymore. Anyway, <laughs> we had trackers in there and all kinds of stuff and, and APERS transmitters. So we followed the thing all over the place. And then about two and a half hours later, you go pick it up. That particular flight, we went to an uh, altitude of uh, 207,495 uh, 207, feet. Wow. 207,400. And one of the uh, 100, 107,249 feet. Yes, my wife just corrected me. And uh, the, the interesting thing is, the uh, one of the guys in our club walked up to me just before we were ready to launch and said, I forgot to bring my package along because a lot of times we're launched more than one at a time here. And so he took the sock off of his foot. I'm not kidding you. He took his boot off. He took the sock off. We stuffed his equipment down inside the sock, tied it to the string and launched it with it. <laughs> so, <laughs> and that's, that's absolute truth. I can show you pictures. <laughs> and he got his sock back? He got his sock back, yes. <laughs> and we did it from a Boy Scout camp, as you can see there. We, we have done many from a Boy Scout camp, so. Yeah. We've had a lot of fun doing this. My wife is W0DLK, and uh, her and I are, are pretty much all that's left of Near Space Ventures. Uh, um, Sela, who I don't think... Uh, you never really had a chance to meet Sila. I was kind of hoping he'd join us tonight, but he, he didn't. Sila, AK0SK, he, uh, he is probably a member now too because last time he launched a Pico, he had to buy the gas with our 
account at the at the store. So he's an honorary member. <laughs> he's a great guy when you get the chance to meet him. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for joining us, Keith. You're welcome. It was a you did a great job on that flight. You really, really did, and uh, I appreciate you letting me sit in on your on your meeting tonight. Well, you're welcome. I surprised myself. I really did. <laughs> so. And you have enough helium left over for like doing kids parties now. I I do. It was just a few <laughs> puffs of helium. <laughs> so now you can do the little puppy dogs and all that stuff, right? <laughs> well, the. Uh, the uh, tank came with 50 balloons, so I'm, I'm ready for a party. There you go. I yeah. might need to talk to you about a grandkids party coming up. Yeah. Use, use, them, use them soon, though. The tank leaks, trust me. Yeah. <laughs> um, hey, you can recoup the cost of the, uh, of the flight by selling uh, balloon uh, animals. Yeah, that's right. That's yeah. right. <laughs> yeah. Well, hey, guys, I'm, I'm going to have to check out. Uh, I've only been.